it is of ours to come into his place and to reside in his presence and to be able to partake of this meal that he has in graciously invited us to partake of so that we can share in the fellowship of the law of God and the friendship one with another. And we're glad that uh, uh, some that have been out are back and feeling better and hope that that remains the same. Amongst the people that I was raised with, there came a time in a young man's life when he went from a child to a young man and then went to a ceremony, a ceremony that a lot of people would not expect to be too uh, disturbing, only to the young man that was going through it. For he would be taken to an area in the forest or the woods that he had never been in. And there he would be caused to sit on a tree or a stump and his hands tied behind him and a bandana or a cloth put over his eyes. And there he would be left by himself all night long. If you've never been in a forest at night like that without any way to defend yourself or to protect your life, you don't know what every sound would make. Every time a leaf would bend, every time a bird would screech, or every time you'd hear the, the cry of a mountain lion, or you'd listen to a bear, which you hoped was a long way off, with no way to protect yourself and with no way to defend your life, you, in order to become a man amongst your people, would have to sit in that place. You couldn't run. You couldn't cry out in fear. And when the morning hours began to come upon your eyes, the one thing that would always be true in that that you were told is that you can begin to undo your hands and take the thing from off your eyes and look around and know that you're a man in the world of things. But the one thing that you wouldn't reckon that, that was a surprise for everyone that would be there that in all of that time of torture and trial and testing and all of the means available for you to Make yourself a man to have confidence in yourself. There, sitting across from you, unknown to yourself, would be your father. For years, I would have had a lot of times the strength and the courage to do a lot of things had I realized that the Father was always sitting there watching our lives as we lived. You conduct a wedding or a funeral and you see a lot of times the difference in the phases of life through which man goes through. Quite honestly, in a ceremony of a funeral or a wedding, there's not too many things that you can say that are wrong and most of the time people are always going to tell you that it was a, either a beautiful ceremony or a wonderful speech. Because a wedding was a happy place, nobody was really hurting. And one could cite and recite poetry or do anything he wanted to and add compliments that would be that which would cause everyone to smile. But a funeral is different. The reality and finality of death is there all too obvious. Ah, oh, there's many things that can be said at a funeral, but there is only one message which gives hope. And that message is the gospel of Christ. This is because the gospel of Christ has as its eternal theme the message of the resurrection from the dead and the resulting of the hope of the resurrection and eternal life for every child of God. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, as we deal with the resurrection, 
Paul deals with the subject of death and the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. And in so doing, gives a clear, concise definition of the gospel found nowhere else in the Bible. He shows how a denial of the resurrection of the dead is a denial of the gospel itself. And how believing in the gospel gives one hope from, for the next world as for the present. Yet in all this period of time, from birth to death, as children of God, we do not see setting across from us our Father. Setting there to guard, to guide in the middle of the night when there would be danger that no one could comprehend or understand when an animal would come that would try to take your life or, or when something would come upon you that you didn't understand. There would always be that presence, but none known to most people. It is something that now never allowed themselves to become a man. We have in the gospel of Christ that anticipation and hope. If Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some amongst us teach that there's no resurrection? In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter and the 12th verse, Paul discloses the problem which prompts the writer of this book and the Corinthian saints to finally come to grips with the problems that they'd had throughout the discussion of the entire book. Denying the resurrection, denying the fact that there is an anticipation forms the entirety of area that causes a lot of people to have no peace. The Greek pagans denied the resurrection of the dead as we can see from the book of Acts in the 17th chapter and about verse 30. And Paul preached to them these words. Therefore, having looked at the time of ignorance, God is now demanding that all men repent because he has determined a day in which he will judge the world by that man whom he hath ordained and has furnished us proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And the Bible says in verse 32, Now when, they heard, when they'd heard the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, and others said, We'll hear you on this matter again. But there were a group that listened. The Greeks may have believed in the immortality of men as spirits, but they did not see the response that was theirs to the teaching of the God of heaven. Unlike the Sadducees, who believed there was no spirits or angels, but like the Pharisees, who confessed both, they denied the power thereof. You see, my friend, as we study the Word of God, we see and recognize that God has raised our standard of living by allowing us to realize and know that across from us, standing and watching and preparing and protecting and establishing a means by which we can be confident that we can win this battle, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts, the 23rd chapter, the 6th through the 9th verses, when Paul came before the Sadducees and the Pharisees in respect of his life, Paul began to cry and he said, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I'm on trial for the hope and the resurrection of the dead. He said this because he looked around him and he saw that there was a segment there of the Pharisees and a segment of the Sadducees. And the assembly was divided. Because of this, there arose a great uproar. And some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue heartedly, We find no fault in this man, for a spirit or an angel hath in fact spoken to him. And the Sadducees denied the power of all. 
to avoid the worldly and empty clatter through which we live from day to day, we need to understand what God has prepared for we who are faithful. To be able to live that life which God has determined we must live. We have to have the confidence and the knowledge of knowing. And knowing beforehand. That there sets one across from us. Who looks and guards and directs our lives. And will allow us to one day be at peace with him in whom. The resurrection is a present possession. Rather than a future hope. And it must be seen as something we realize that is true and will be. But the problem with the Corinthian brethren is they had been taught by those like Hymes and Alexander, if you look at 1 Timothy 2, that the resurrection had passed already. And so the Corinthian brethren, because they thought the resurrection had already passed, had garnered themselves into little clamps, little tribes. You know, they went back like to the 12 tribes of Israel. Some say that I'm of Paul. Some say I'm of Cephas. Some say I'm of Christ. Yeah, he met a few. But uh, the, the very fact is that they didn't believe that the God who made them had made it possible for them to be successful. And they went after the ungodly life that they had seen as their desire without trying to seek for the spiritual life that was theirs. You see, if there's no resurrection, if it's past already, if judgment has already come, then why do we have to put ourselves in jeopardy, as Paul said, he had himself even to this very hour? The first four chapters of 1 Corinthians deals with these divisions and factions which disrupted the unity of the church at Corinth. These divisions were based upon pride, which some had taken in certain leaders in their teachings. The Corinthians were puffed up because of their leaders. And they said, you know, I'm of Paul. Some said, I'm of Cephas. The others say, I'm of Apollos. These leaders were those which they thought would be the means by which they could get to eternity. But none of them realized that Paul, Peter, Apollos, or any of that kind of an individual, even though great in their teaching, would not be they or he who would give them the resulting resurrection to life for which they were living. So Paul would write, and he said, Now to these two, I wrote to these things to Apollos and transferred or figured to myself and to him in a figure, that we know go beyond that which is written, and not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And what did you have that you have not received? And if you received it, why do you glory in it? And if you glory in it, you have made yourselves to reign as king. But then if you looked at the way Paul was living, he was not reigning as king. He was reigning as a servant or a slave. So Paul said, I think God has taken the apostleship or we apostles and has made us a pattern or shown us to be an example or as a spectacle to the world, both the angels and the men. And we're fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise. We're weak. You're strong. And you are those who reign as kings. And here we have no certain dwelling place. For we're homeless. And the preaching of the gospel is not doing you any good. Because the gospel was not being preached. So to the Corinthian letter and the 15th chapter, the first four verses... He goes to the very reason for which the entire book of Corinth was written. As was read in your hearing, if you take your Bibles and turn there quickly, you will see that this is the end of the discussion. He who sits there in their presence, who is the means by which all the strength and the courage will always be ours, stands there and overlooks. 
So he said, because of this, brethren, or moreover, as is translated into King James, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel that we preached unto you. This gospel is the death and the burial and the resurrection. But somebody says that that, that was Christ. That's already taken place. So we don't we need to worry about that. But if you'll read the letter that Paul wrote to the uh, Hebrew uh, brethren, you'll see that Christ has become our forerunner who went beyond the veil or went beyond death or went past death or over was overwhelmed in that death so that he might be a faithful high priest to all of us who are obedient and call upon his name. As we understand this privilege and we understand this instruction, we don't remember the fact that we have not yet won. We're passing from childhood to manhood. And we go through all the tortures and the things that could be involved in being isolated and alone. And no one seems to be guarding our path for we're blinded to all of that by the world in which we live. And our hands are tied behind us so we can't do work that we think we should do for it is God's job to defend, to provide, and to protect. But if there's no resurrection and if we can't find in the scriptures the fact that when all of this life is over, there will come a day of a general resurrection when the righteous shall be raised in the power and the glory of Christ. Paul says our preaching is in vain. Our hope is in vain. For if it be preached that Christ is not risen from the dead, we are of all men most miserable. Now here's where you find a lot of us today. We're miserable. We won't let go and let God lead. We won't decide and determine that he has the answers. We're so overwhelmed with the fact that, well, our hands are untied. We can do what we want. Well, we never can become what we're intended to be if we don't remain under the context of what is going to make us children of God. And the very fact that we've been taught this, not only by example, but by command, in seeing that Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, has for a lot of people made no difference. They think Christ is the only one that's going to be raised. And the resurrection as was taught in the first century is past already, but as taught in the 20th century has no relevance to life. We're on our own. Paul's gospel was one and the same. It was that which was generally proclaimed by all the apostles. It was disdained because, oh, that's too simplistic. You, you, you can't apply that fact and, and it fit my world. I, I just can't have such a thing like that to lead and govern my life. I've got to have the control that I need. I've got to be the man. Knowing that the gospel of Christ is the power of God into salvation, we have not realized that the gospel of Christ is that which leads us from childhood to manhood, from this world to eternity. And he who guides and directs our step and walks in our path and leads our minds by the discussion through his word is he that stands and guards us all the path that we follow in this world. And so what we have to do is relinquish the control that God has had on us and the power that his message will reveal to us to be our own controlling factor and our own power. If there is no resurrection to your concept of life and for our teaching and instruction, I would agree. 
But if there is, what are you going to do with Christ? If we live in this world and there's not something yet to come. Somebody say, well, I, I just believe that there's not going to be a resurrection. Well, what is going to happen? He who created is he that's going to destroy. He that brought into being is he that's going to cause it to cease to be. And as Jesus comes back in his power with his mighty angels, he's going to come back and take vengeance. On them that know not God. And obey not the gospel. Why? Well you know vengeance means. To engender wrath upon somebody. Who has offended those whom you love. Yeah usually we take vengeance on people. That we figure are incapable of defending themselves. And for somebody to be taught. Like it was in the case of the church before the fall of Jerusalem, that the coming of Christ and the things that he prophesied and predicted would not come true, God had a great wrath for that preacher. Turn back to Matthew, the 24th chapter, and I'll read it with you, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. We'll start with about verse 30, 45. Who then is this faithful and wise servant? Whom his Lord hath made ruler. He's made his servant. To be the teacher of his household. To give them information as they live. Or to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant. Whom his Lord when he cometh shall find so doing. But verily I say unto you. That he shall make him ruler over all of his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of the servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour when he is not aware, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Of all the times that people hear the gospel of Jesus Christ preached. How many times have you heard about the fact of the resurrection? The resurrection is on its way. The resurrection is coming. The resurrection is going to be for those who in glory have received the spirit of God. For if the Spirit of God is not in us, when Christ comes back, that body that had resided, or where the Holy Spirit had resided, will not have one to raise. Turn with me to the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, and we're going to look at verse 11. If that gospel which we have heard preached does not tell us that in order to make sure that the resurrection will be one of glory and vindication of our Christianity, we'll not be able to realize and have a reason for our obedience to God. Otherwise, we're just like all the rest of the people in the world. I notice that the people in America are becoming more European all the time. If you're European and you don't care about God, you don't think about God, you get a bicycle club on Sunday and you play games or do whatever you want to, Sunday is just another day of the week. Television and atheism has about educated us out of Christianity. And like the other heathen, and we're trying to pattern ourselves after the European society, unfortunately, the other heathen in this world act as though there is no God. And if there is no God, there's no hope. If there's no God, there's no resurrection. If there's no God, there's no payment for the final punishment. Have you never realized or reckoned that the reason that children are supposed to be corrected by their parents and punished is so that they won't become fools and destroy their life? And haven't you understood that the amount of punishment is that which has to be equal to the uh, transgression that is... Uh, been put in place and that if you try to uh, show sympathy or if you try to show friendship or if you try to let on like there's no reason for a child to be corrected or punished you're not a good steward of what God has given you look at Romans 8 and 11 
But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. But somebody doesn't say, but do you have the spirit of God in you? Well, how in the world does the spirit of God come in? Well, you've heard this quoted so many times, you can quote it for yourself. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And here's the answer. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now this gift which God gives is to said, that's Acts 2.38, Acts 5.32. It's given to all them that obey God. Now the person then who thinks that there's no possibility or no reason for them to be obedient to the God of heaven doesn't realize that something inevitable is coming. Doesn't realize that there's one of these days that the trumpet's going to sound and Jesus now coming back as the judge of the quick and the dead. These are those who are children of God, by the way, not the world. But coming back as the judge of the quick and the dead is coming back to hand out an eternal sentence. The time of watching, the time to become a man, the time to have made your calling and election sure is over. But what if you're not brought to constant recognition to the fact that the time is coming? And if you don't know that the time is coming, you haven't prepared yourself for that present time that you know Christ will come back to receive those whom he loves. But when the Lord comes back, he's coming back for those that are his. He's coming back for those who've been obedient to his gospel. He's coming back for those that have followed the pattern that he established, died, was buried and is resurrected. You see, to have a part in the first resurrection, the second death will have no power over us. Turn with me to the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter, and you'll see that the Apostle Paul gave this message to John. And when he gave this message, it was for our benefit. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But shall be priest of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. How is it that we can have part in the first resurrection? It's in the resurrection of Christ. It was the very fact that when Christ rose from the dead he set a pattern. How is it that Christ rose from the dead? He'd been buried. He was buried after he suffered the pangs of death and torture and punishment and went to the Hadean world and as he ascended, gave gifts to men. But as he resurrected, he brought with him those that had been away from him, blindfolded, handcuffed, restrained, and were praying, O oh Lord God, how long will it be? till thou avenge our blood on this land. Many times, folks, we forget the very fact that there's a great day coming. That there's a day of the resurrection. And because we put that out of our minds and want to live like the rest of the world and, and want to act and talk and go on as they do, we are not living proof of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That that's sown in weakness. Paul cries, is going to be raised in power. That which is sown a natural body shall be raised a spiritual body. Talking about the two kinds of existence that we as humans have. But what about the person who didn't participate in the first resurrection? What about the individual who has not the Spirit of God in his heart? What about the person who's never been taught? That the resurrection is coming and is as sure as is the fact that the day will one day cease to be. How confident are we and are those who have teachers and preachers who try to tell us that we could not follow the pattern of God. 
We do not have to listen to his commands or his intentions. We do not have to obey from the heart that gospel of Christ. We don't have to learn to live like Christ. We don't have to prepare for that great day that's coming. For the judgment's passed already. We already could eat and drink and be merry. Because we think that all we do tomorrow is to die. But what comes after death? The resurrection. Somebody says, well, what comes after death is the judgment, but the resurrection will proceed. The judgment of where you're going to spend eternity takes place at death. But the judgment of where you'll spend eternity is there assigned by Christ for those who are redeemed. He who has guided and guarded and watched our footsteps and trod, trod the path of our lives that we have walked is going to stand in his regal splendor and overwhelming power and majesty. And he's going to say to them on the right, come ye blessed of my father and inherit the joys that were laid up for you from the foundations of the world. For you fought a good fight, you finished the course, and you kept the faith. Henceforth there is later for you a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto you at that day, Paul writes. And not to you only. And here's where you and I come in. All them that love his appearing. If you think of the coming back of Christ right now, do you shudder? If I could actually get you to consider the seriousness of your eyes blinded and your hands tied behind you. And you are in this world without any help or any aid. And there is nothing to come and defend you should a wild animal attack or something take your life. If I could get you to believe that the security of your world is not secure at all. If I could cause you to know. And one of these days when Jesus comes back. That which had been sown in weakness. Is going to be raised. And that if the spirit of God is not in that body which is raised. There will be no body in which you will be raised. Would it cause you to have a different picture. And an understanding of the plan of God. Would you not know that he's prepared for you a means of obedience that will allow all of us to be protected and received as a loving father to a son on the day that you become a man? The resurrection of the dead has not passed. Go to the graveyards. If Christ had come back and the dead had all been raised, there'd be nobody there. But the silent city of the dead speak not at all. And they on whose bodies and remains you can trample as you walk on them. And I think without respect. Are those who have no anxious desire for the Lord to come again. For they've not lived a life that is a life of preparation. They have not lived a life of anticipation. They've not looked a life looking forward to. And if the Lord was to come back. Would this be a good day? The poet wrote. What a beautiful thing. For the Lord to come back again. What a beautiful day. For him to come and gather his people in. What a beautiful thought that a lot of people have never ever considered. That when Jesus returns, it's going to be the greatest day of our existence. Oh yeah, it was a great day when we heard the gospel and obeyed it. It was a great day when we taught and raised our children in the gospel of Christ that they might find themselves teaching their own. It's a great day when we were in love with a mate that had the same faith as we and we lived our lives together. That's a great day. But the greatest day of all of our life, which we don't spend any time anticipating, 
which we don't look at and understand is yet to come. Changes the entire way we think as we live. It's the resurrection. Have you considered that the Lord is coming? Somebody says, well, that's a child's story because like the scoffers back in Peter's day, all things continue as they were since the fathers fell asleep. Ah, but there's one thing you've got to remind yourself about God. Time is not important. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And then there's another thing. And this comes right on the heels of that doctrine, First, uh, 2 Peter 3, 8, 9. Not only does the Lord not count time by time, but he is not slack concerning his promise. Now, as a little boy, a lot of times we'd get in trouble. And mom and daddy would say, you know what? I'm going to get you when I get you home. Well, we heard that. Did we take it to heart? Well, it's according to how severe the punishment we thought would be. And we'd get in the car and we'd start home. And all oh, did we ask for a long ride. Because the longer the ride... The longer the time, the more the lapse of memory, the tireder they would be. You know what? Maybe we'll get off with this one. Maybe we won't have to pay the punishment. We'd get out of the car. Instead of getting out of the car and joy and bounding and going to the house, we'd get out looking like, well, do you remember? We do. I'll tell you, if you'll let me go this time, I won't do it again. You know, all the repentance you would do. And what if they never, ever paid back? Did they lie? No, not intentionally. The point is, if they had never lived up to their position as parents, had they never corrected and intended, had they never loved us enough to make us obey, all I'm telling you is that if Jesus Christ is not going to do what he said he was going to do, then the loving father that he has been to his bride, the church, and the family of which we're a part, has not had that kind of father that has guided us. Oh, but the Lord's not slack concerning his promise. He'll do exactly what he said he will do. And one day the trumpet's going to sound. And when you hear that, tr that trumpet, you're going to hear the shout of the archangel. That's Christ. And the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those that are already dead, whose bodies are in the ground, whose souls and spirits he's bringing with them, they will come forth first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to be with the Lord in the air. But we'll all be changed. This is your chance of preparing for manhood. This is your chance from going from a sinner to a child of God. This is your chance because the resurrection's coming. Oh, somebody may have deluded you and deceived you into thinking that it's not going to. But God has promised. And God will not change that promise. And God has demanded that those whom he has blessed by obedience to the gospel, having obeyed the gospel and been faithful unto death, will be rewarded by being invited in through the gates into the city of life. But here's the fearful thing. To those that are on the left, he's going to say, depart. I never knew you. And be cast into the lake of fire. Which is the second death. Every day is a good day. What a beautiful thing. That this might be the day that the Lord will come again. What a beautiful thought. That this is the day that he's coming to take his children in. What a thing that we overlook in our lives. To allow us 
to be obedient. And as he sits and watches and guards our lives, and us not even realizing that he's there, are we passing from sin to salvation, from a child to an adult, from a temporary to an eternal body? Or have we even denied that it's going to come to pass at all? You say, prove to me that there's going to be the resurrection of the dead. That's real simple. The gospel I preached in you. Preached that Christ died for our sins. That he was buried. And that he rose again the third day. And if Christ is risen from the dead, our preaching is not vain. Our faith is not vain. We are not yet in our sins. And his example is that that we need to follow. You've been over to Jerusalem yet to find where Christ is in his tomb? He's not there. Where'd he go? You said he didn't exist. Well, you have not agreed with anything of the history of that time. He was, but he still is. But that in which he dwelt is not there. Where did it go? He is now residing in his glorious body, which all of us anticipate will be that of our standing when the second coming has concluded. There's the proof that you need. You take somebody over to a graveyard and you find the place where they're buried and you can say, well, I know that they lived. There was their body. Well, we know that Christ lived. Where's his body? And the gospel being preached could cause you to remind yourself that the resurrection has not passed already. If you're here and need to respond to the invitation of the gospel, the resurrection's coming. You better be prepared. You better make your peace calling and election sure. You better stand in his presence in obedience so that you can be with him in his glory. In eternity. Will you come as we stand and see?